What's up, people? Welcome to this episode of the Body Hood Podcast slash webcast because I don't know how you're consuming this content. I'm your host as usual. My name is Jimmy. Before we get started, I want to say what's up to my partner, Corey. Corey, what's going on? What's going on, Jim? How you feeling, man? Ain't nothing, man. Like you in the streets out here still chasing a dollar, man. I am. I, I ain't chasing no dollars, though. Dollars chase me. No doubt. I heard that. I heard that. Listen, man, Um, another special episode. This is episode 33. Um, as I always say, make sure you share this content. We are highlighting brothers and sisters who are doing amazing work in the community, um, whether they're building businesses, whether they're working, um, doing community service, whatever it is they're doing, as long as it's something positive, we want to make sure we highlight it and we want to tell you guys to share it. Um, you know, you guys like to share fight videos and all the ratchetness, share some of the good stuff too. <laughs> and um, shout out to all of our followers too, uh, because our following is growing. Um, our, our listens are, are tremendous, especially on Apple Podcasts. It's crazy, uh, Core. Always check the analytics and Apple Podcasts is probably, in terms of um, our show, the most uh, listened to thing. So shout out to everybody on Apple Podcasts. Um, we're trying to get our YouTube following up, though. So make sure that um, if you listen to this, you go to our YouTube channel. And um, if you got a Gmail account, all you have to do is hit the button so you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, also, want to just point out real quick that, uh, you know, our book, Own Your Time and Space, is available. Me and Corey uh, co-wrote a book together called Own Your Time and Space. And coming in 2020, we got some new merch. Like, Corey got the shirt on now, but we got the Body Hood shirts coming soon. But um, not at all the commercials out the way, man. I want to introduce this brother right here. He is doing amazing work in the field of banking. He has, uh, you know, an extensive background. Um, I met this brother years and years ago. And I don't know if you remember this, James, but it was interesting. One of the first conversations we had, we were talking about, like, the history of J.P. Morgan. And when we had this conversation, I was like, yo, he's different. Because <laughs> I, know, I know I'm a little weird and nerded out because I used to, like, watch the biography channels. And that was one of the ones that would interest me. But we had a conversation on, like, the history of J.P. Morgan. But nonetheless, he's um, accomplished tremendous things in the world of banking. So I want him to bring, uh, bring him on and tell his story because, yes, there are brothers and sisters who are doing tremendous work in the, in the world of banking. He's the vice president um, of, of a bank with over about $10 billion in the management. So he's the vice president of that bank. And he has a history uh, all throughout. He's worked at the national banks, regional banks, and, and, and the like. But I'll let him tell a story. Without further ado, I want to bring on Brother James Sanders. James, how are you? I'm good, Jimmy, man. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, excited to be on the show. You've been doing big things since we met back in the day. He was talking about stocks and investing and, and, and doing a whole bunch of that. Yeah. Pulling out the stock certificates for real. Uh, <laughs> Back in the day when you had to like call a broker and put your orders in, like, yes, you know, yes. is it amazing how things change over time? How quickly fast now you happen? can push a button, right? Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing, man. Oh, yeah. yeah, man. But um, you know, let's get right into it. Let's talk about your background. Like you have an extensive background in finance, but growing up, what part of it where were you from and what made you actually go into finance? Was it something that you know you got from your parents? Or what, what was it about finance that made that, you know, made you made your career? Well, you know, Jimmy um, and Corey, when I grew up, I saw some really awesome things. My mother and father uh, did very well for themselves. And I took a, a page out of their book and decided to follow in their footsteps. That's false. That's not the way it went down. <laughs> not the way it went down. Right? Uh, when I grew up <laughs> here in the city of Philadelphia, um, life was real. Uh, grew up in the, you know, I was born in 76, man, I'm 43. And I, you know, for me, the nineties was, uh, was, was real. Right. Uh, murder rate was crazy. That, that, that was a get out. That was a get out and lay down era. Yes. And, um, you know, crack epidemic right now, opioids is the thing, but you know, and I lived on a block where the JBM and them boys, like, you know, the car that was up the street from my house. Gotcha. So it was real. You know what's interesting about that, though? Um, I was telling someone the other day, just based on data, right? Because we talk about how bad the murder rate is and things. When you start looking at what the murder rate was in the 90s, yeah. it doesn't even look real, right? We may get 300 no. murders. I mean, I, I, every murder, there's no, you know, there's no such thing as a good murder rate. You know what I mean? I'm not no. trying to say no. that. But when you look at it in retrospect, you say, yo, how did I live through that? It's crazy. Man, it was right? like 590 something back in our day. Yo, yeah, it was like 600 year, we almost had a, oh, Didn't we almost hit a stack one year or something crazy? Yeah. Like like now it was Easy. absolutely nuts. Like every everything was hard. Getting yeah, on the train yeah. was tough. Catching the yeah. bus to school, every, going to the store, like yeah. everything you was real. To literally protect your neck just to go to school. Like look, look, if you if you had something and somebody wanted it, they was taking it. You never wanted to, you never wanted to answer the question. Yo, what time you got? 
You never want to answer that question. You never what, size, that question. what size you wear? <laughs> yeah, what size you? You never want to answer that question. You you know, you want to make sure you don't put your eight ball jacket on. Matter of fact, I never had an eight ball jacket, right? So I'll condense what I'm really trying to say. I grew up in an era where it was very challenging economically. Um, and we moved a lot. So you asked me a direct question. What part of the city did we grow up in? So I'm going to give you a direct answer. I grew up all over the city. I, you know, I think outside of South Philly and Northeast Philly, I lived in all, like, I think it's six quadrants. I lived in four of them, gotcha. right, in the city. And, you know, I went to, like, three or four different elementary schools, two middle schools, finally landed in one high school, right? So failed in seventh grade um because I, I got very sick i am a chronic asthmatic didn't play sports at all you know a lot of kids little league they running around all that and i was a sick asthmatic little fat boy eating a big box of cheese cheese balls i'm in a big generic bag of cheese balls <laughs> i used to i used to kill those joints it was a dollar right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i stayed in the crib eating that and cookies right uh, watching tv so you know food stamps that was my life man and so what I started to see growing up, and I, it just was confusing to me. Like, I would come outside, man, and just see despair and, like, you know, drug addicts and people, like, robbing full. It was like, that's, I saw it, right? And we were homeless several times, right? Lived in a car, lived in a garage, like, my, you know, with a man, like my, my step pop as well, right? So imagine a family, right, of at 1.3, then 4, then 5, Homeless, not cool, right? Yeah. Uh, where we was, we was drinking like that little cheap Kool Aid juice you buy in the gallon from the store, right? We called it bug juice back in the day. Um, <laughs> I know what you're talking and, about. And so I'm trying to give folks context to how I got where I am and what drives me, right? So all this is context, and and so we landed up in the Omni section. Some may call it Broad Omni, some may call it East Oak Lane, some may call it Fern Rock, right? And that's kind of where we settled at, right? But life was still turbulent there. And, um, you know, for me, I just couldn't understand why we were where we were. Um, and I just kind of thought there was something better, just kind of watching TV, things like that. So I'll fast forward through all that, man. When I failed it, there was a couple of things that happened in your life that become life-changing, right? And, and that makes you sort of like a switch goes off in your mind that says, I'm not going to do that again. Whether it's that moment where you put your hand on the stove because they told you to stop doing it and it burns you, right? You probably won't do it again. Or you trip and fall and hit your head because you were running and you didn't look, right? Or you were riding your bike and you hit the front brake, so now you took the front brakes off. Remember, we always take the front brakes off. Absolutely, right? absolutely. <laughs> right? So all of those little things. So what happened with me, when I was in the seventh grade, I failed, right? And I went to summer school, but not really. Went back and, um, you know, I failed. I was in the hospital for a long time uh, from being sick. I think I had flu or pneumonia or something. I had, it was pneumonia. Got out, went back in, got out, went back in, kind of did the work. I went to one of the worst middle schools in my time around. Um, I thought it was one of the worst. I did personally. Uh, on paper, it may not have been, but it was Jay Cook Middle School. I literally hated that school, right? It was like gangs, violence. Every day after school, right, they was like, the other school was fighting. It was, it was just horrible. Yeah. Um, people getting jumped on the trains, like stick up boys out. It was, it was real, right? Yeah. Just, uh -huh. It was like East Side High, but it was middle school. <laughs> <laughs> right? middle school. It was middle school, man. And back then, you know, I think middle school was like ninth grade back then, like something like that. It was crazy. <clears throat> so um, after that, man, I went back to school. And I stood in line. I remember you have to stand in line, get your rosters. And I'm in the eighth grade line, like, yeah, all right, cool. I'm about to go ahead and get this eighth grade roster. And the advisor was like, nah, I think you go go check in that line. So I was like, man, that's the seventh grade line. Like, I don't want to go back over there. So I went over there with my mom. And my name was on the seventh grade roll. I bawled crying like a little girl. Just, ah, just, oh, man, like, I can't believe this. I got to stay in this school two more years. I failed. Uh -huh. So at that point, <clears throat> I told myself, one, I ain't going to never fail again. And two, all that laughing, ki 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 and ha 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 in the classroom with my boys. <clears throat> stopped doing that. Like, I just stopped banging with dudes. And, right, I just stopped catching the train home and I would walk, right? Because the train was super dangerous. And if you walk, you could dip in alleyways. You could dip, like, you could move easier. 
But I just, so I walked home instead of getting on the train, right? That was kind of a way to stay out of trouble. Uh, and then I learned I needed some money. So I start going to the little, um, it was a shopping bag in Logan. <clears throat> I think it was, yeah, I think it was a shopping bag. I would go to shopping bag, dudes down there, they was bagging and getting mm -hmm. tips. Yeah. So I, boom, I, I hopped on the bandwagon, start bagging, getting tips, right? But boom, I got bullied out because it was more dudes from, from Logan. They was like, no, nah, man, we got this. So all right, I had to find another supermarket, right? Because yeah. like I missed, it. I missed one day and dudes came down. It was a rat, right? I couldn't get back in. You had to get there early. Mm -hmm. Right, so my tip money was out, so I found another supermarket bagging in there. And um, when I turned 15, man, I got 15 and a half. This, uh, these Jewish folks owned a drug store, it was Esquire Drugs, a broad and shoe. Some people might know, know that exactly what you're talking I know exactly, yeah, what you're right on the corner, right? So, man, you know, I used to run errands for my parents all the time, right? I was a house full of people, so they asked me, say, Hey, you looking for a job? I was a big young boy, man. I was. You know, in middle school, I was already like 6'1", 225. Yeah. Right? So I was a big dude already. And um, so they asked me if I wanted a job. And I was surprised. Like, what, really a job? Right? I ain't had working papers, nothing. So fast forward through all that, man. I ended up getting a job. You know, I worked there for like seven years. I went on to college. Um, and I actually quit that job by my, by my junior year in college. Um, but I'll tell you a story about working at that place, man. Mm -hmm. um, most people that I grew up with, when they had a check, they went to the check cashing place. Yeah. Right. Everybody went to the check cashing place, even though at that time it was probably four or five banks in the neighborhood. My people didn't go to the bank. Right. I'm going to put a lesson out here. Most of us have beliefs and a belief system. Right. Those belief systems may not come from us. They could be come from our parents, people we're associated with, our friends, or these things we thought up, TV shows we watch, <clears throat> which is called programming, right? It's called programming for a reason. So the limiting belief was if you put that money in the bank, bank gonna get you or the IRS gonna come get you. I would hear my mom, my step pop talk about that all the time. I was a young boy, I had no idea what that meant. So I would go to check out some clips like everybody else. Until one day, the, uh, the store owners, they would always ask me to make a run down to the uh, bank, you know, drop something off for them, right? It was a money run. And I would, I would always say to them, like, yo, y'all walking down the street, y'all look suspect. Y'all like two white dudes walking down the street at the same time every day going past Royal Nolly to the bank. Y'all can get robbed. <laughs> like, I would tell them, <laughs> what? Yeah, you yeah. Know, that's off, the like, yo, that's like, reality like, back then. Right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, they had to, they had to take, take, like, they had a whole bunch of stands out there, like, somebody gonna get y'all, right? And he was like, well, James, won't you walk with me? I'm like, I ain't trying to, like, jump in the way of no bullet. I'll walk with you, but it ain't gonna be none of that. So, eventually, they start sending me on money runs, right? And I'm like, all right, these people trust me enough. They're sending me on money runs. So, the other thing, that what I did was, I was like, all right, if I'm gonna make a money run, I'm gonna throw food in the bag, and I'm gonna make it look like I'm carrying groceries. Right? So yeah. I would have like groceries literally on top of the bag and it looked like I was carrying groceries, but it's really money in there. Right? And so I walked the money down and one day one of the tellers, they had some black tellers, it was women, cool. And it was like, yo, James, like, you got a bank account? I was like, no. Nah. It was like, well, won't you open one? I was like, I can open one? And they said, yeah. That was a light bulb. Another one of those moments that changed yeah. your life. Guess what, bruh? At 16, I opened my own bank account. I was no longer going to the check cashing place where they was charging me a percentage, taking some of my money from it before I got it. And that's just now, because- I now got a bank account. That's just because you didn't know any better. Because I didn't know any better. My environment didn't teach me, right? They didn't teach me in school. No, I didn't know. Come yeah. on, man. I had to, like, when I asked for money to get to school in the morning, my mom, they went to the food stamp book, broke out a couple jaws. If they gave me a five, I'm like, I got to break a five. That's going to be hard. Like, me, a couple dollar jaws. I go down there, buy some gum to do, get some change. I could drop it in, I'm out. But I got a food stamp. I was like, damn, I got, like, you can be embarrassed. Like, what am I going to do with it? Right? Yeah. I got, I can't take this to school. Right? So I, I said, man, I'm, I just got to get a job. Like, I got to do it myself. Right? So my mom had five kids. We were scrambling. So I'm like, yo, I'm going to just take care of me. So I said, look, I went to my mom, like, mom, you ain't got to worry about it no more. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm going to get a job. So I got a job. 
I said, you ain't got to buy me no school clothes, no lunch money, nothing. I'm going to do everything, right? Like, all, she didn't buy to buy me food. Like, I just took care of me outside of them having a roof over my head, and that didn't mm-hmm. last long many times, man. So, you know, another life-changing moment, and again, how I got to where I am, and, and all of this is explaining why I'm so driven, right? Yeah. So the story is why I'm so driven. It's not about money. It's, not, it's, it's, the, it's what built the drive in me, right? Mm-hmm. My upbringing. And so, man, I think I was somewhere around 16, 16 and a half, going on 17, you know, things got real in the household. My step pop, super abusive to my moms and all that good stuff. I'm talking on some old, like, man, if you ever seen Antoine Fisher like that, but worse, right? Yeah. So at one evening, man, my mom yelling, screaming, crying, right? And I thought I was dreaming. I'm asleep. She yelling my name. I wake up. I run up from the basement, run to her room whole bunch of people standing in the room. My step pop got a gun pointed at her. Whoa. I'm, I'm like, oh, snap. So my man, he went to pull the trigger. I jumped in the front, boom, gun jam. Now, I didn't see that same gun because I didn't shot it a couple times, right? As a young, same gun. Mm-hmm. Gun jam. That was one of the things, hindsight being 2020, when I was a young boy, that showed me God was real, right? And we ended up later on that night, man, two, three in the morning, somewhere in Norris Town in a women's shelter. Wow. Life was real. My mom and her five kids, right? Wow. Homeless yeah. again for like for like the umpteenth time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and I'm, I think at this point, I'm like a junior, a sophomore, junior in high school, right? Playing football on the track team, wrestling, to, like you know, all this stuff, right? Working, take but all these things happen and still just 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 challenge. You still, you still dealing so with real life. Help. You dealing with real life while real you still life. in high school. What high school did you go to? High school. Omni. You went Omni. Okay. So, okay. Omni, Omni High School. Okay. All right. Yeah. Got you. So, uh, Omni you, High School. You, you still have to deal with real life out there. And that's crazy. You know, man, thank you for sharing that part of your story because it's interesting because one of the things that Corey and I do, um, and we do it every year, uh, generally over like Martin Luther King uh, birthday, we always go speak to the uh, kids in prison, whatever. And we talk to them about finances and stuff. And one of the things I recognize from doing that and spending time with those, those kids who are behind the wall is that like they all have stories. And a lot of times we're quick to judge someone, but we have no idea what some of the stuff that they have going on in their homes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and at that one wrong turn, because they're dealing with all these things, but you, I mean, you seem to persevere through all that. So yeah. how'd you get to the point where you realize that you can be a college student? So because like, so I'm going to back up and pause on this, you know, and I'm pausing because I don't want to be too wordy because I, because I tend to be wordy, right? So um, most, of, mo- most of my siblings, un- not, uh, uncles, cousins, they was gangsters, like bad dudes, right? And I thought to myself, but, but so because I was young, I got a chance to see like the whole lifestyle of whole life cycle of, of being a bad dude. Right, mm-hmm. the drugs from the guns to the so I got a chance to see them be real high ball out all the cars to getting shot shot at to being broke. So I got a chance to see all of it, not just the good, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right, so mm-hmm. I was like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it was just that simple, right? I just said, All right, I'm not gonna be like that. Like, it was real, like they was cooking in my crib, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, listen, they, you they can. Was, All right, time for y'all go to sleep. <laughs> they, 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 they was in there. No, the thing is, you learn from everybody, right? Sometimes yes. you people with you. You learn what to not, you learn exactly. what not to do. Exactly. Yeah, right? Exactly. Some people say, boom, I'm going to do that, right? But I was like, nah, but they ain't eating like they were, right? Like, I mean, like if they were like exceedingly abundantly doing well, I, I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to do that. But, like, it didn't go down that way. Like, because I saw everything, right? And I used to air hustle, so I would listen. I didn't necessarily say anything, so I would listen. So I was like, all right, if I just do the opposite of what they're doing and what everybody, because everybody else is doing, if I just do the opposite, I probably will be better off, right? Just just do the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So listen, y'all might laugh at me for this. Everybody around my way, they carry the hammer. So I said, don't carry a hammer. Right? I carried a knife, but I ain't carry a hammer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? I had a crocodile with a D joint on me, right? 
but I ain't carry a hammer. And then, you know, I was always taught, make sure you got you 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 the right size so them boys wouldn't get you, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I made sure, I was like, just do the opposite, right? Um, and so I did that. So from playing sports, I was like, all right, be, be active. I played football. I was on a wrestling team, indoor and outdoor track, summer league basketball. I wasn't good enough to be on a regular basketball team. They were nice, right? Jay Lawson, Spence Polson, like a lot. Of, they were real good. Like, this is the Rashid Wallace era. Yeah, I remember. I, I, me, I me and Corey, yeah, near, yeah. Like, me and Corey play uh, pub, in the public league back then, too. We, uh, yeah, uh, we, we got smacked the, around by them, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I think, yeah, think y'all cooked this day, yeah. But that's either here yeah, or there. Like, right. I was in the same school. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that ain't good. Yeah, like, no. Just, no. So, you know, my, my – so, anyway, I got a chance to play summer league one year. That was about it. But I, I wrestled for all, after all that. So, essentially, man, what I said was be busy. Be active and think about what you want to do for the rest of your life. Now, as an 18 year old, I, I wasn't thinking about what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. It was more about back when we was coming up, it was more of a defensive thinking, right? And I, I can articulate it that way as an adult now. But back then, the way I the way I thought about it, my goals were as follows: don't have any kids before you turn 21, don't get shot or locked up. Right. And and don't die before you turn 19. Right. Those were the stats. Those are the three stats that they always put on TV that said that would happen to African-American boys. And I just said, do the opposite. Just don't do that. Right. And if you overcome those three things and then gra and, and graduate high school, something real basic, but do it right. Graduate high school. And and then maybe you can find a college somewhere like Dude, I, apply, I applied to every college on my own. I did my own financial aid. I went on my own visits and paid for them, right? Like, I did everything. Like, nobody was like, here's a college application. Yeah. Here's No. And back in the day, you couldn't Google it. Like, you had to have a physical application, right? And so I just sought the information, man. I had, a, you know, I had a guidance counselor that wasn't good, but then some, some it was another guidance counselor who, you know, she was on somebody else's letter, like go by last name. She was an African-American woman, very pretty, right? I think she was a Delta. And I, and I saw how well she was helping other students. And I was like, yo, could you help me? Because you helping them, right? Because like the dude I was with, he was like corny. So she was yeah. like, all right. And I would come down new her and visit her like every day. Like, yo, can I get a pass? I'll come visit her just to get all my applications, fee waiver. It's a long story short, man. Play football. Um, I, I excelled at football, although I like basketball a lot. I, I was just better at football. Yeah. And um, I ended up, you know, busting my knee up my senior year. And I still graduated. Um, I got accepted to about six schools. My SAT scores was crap. You know, I ended up getting like a, like a 760 or 780 or something. Back then, it was only two numbers, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it was like eight, eight, eight something. You was great. Right. Like now it's three numbers. So that wasn't good enough. Um, and I, so I got into schools, didn't get any scholarships. And and I went to Virginia State University um, because when I visited the school, it was the antithesis of the city. Right. And I said, okay. well, I can I can survive and thrive here. Right. Because there was nowhere near as much violence. Like it was some in, in the surrounding counties. But, but man, it's not it, what you came from in Philly. No. Right? Like, like it was nowhere near what I came from. You know, when you leave a city, people getting, you know, almost a thousand people dying to maybe 20 or 30. Yeah, okay. it's a whole different thing. So now, so now you can <laughs> yeah. focus on now you can focus on your work and, and, and doing what you gotta right. do. And it was a wall around the school. So when you got down there, what was your initial plan in terms of like major and all that? So when I got to Virginia State, <clears throat> I wanted to be a physical therapist, right? So I, I enjoy science and biology. So I said, all right, well, I'm a, I'm a major in biology. I will major in biology. And from this major, <clears throat> I'll figure out what's next. And I did some research. They said, well, it's going to take you six years. I was like, damn, I'd be broke for six years? I was like, man, I don't know if I could do that. Like, you know, I've been broke my, my whole life. I was just hoping to do this four-year thing, get money and be out. And so before, like a week before class started, I changed my major to economics. And the only reason I changed it to economics was because in my senior year, I had a social 
a sociology class. Um, it was more a social science class, one half social sociology, one half economics. And dude, this was the best class I ever took in school ever, right? And this was my senior year in high school. Dude, I got an A in the class, my first A ever. And I literally enjoyed the class, like everything about it. Right? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? When you enjoy a class, you do well. Yeah. Like I, 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 I loved going to the, I couldn't wait, bro. I got there early and the, and the teacher couldn't get me out. Like I was like fiending for the information, right? Because you know, sociology is a study of the behavior of people. All right. And economics is the study of scarce resources, right? Which has to do with people and how we use our resources. And so I was intrigued because it, it just like, it spoke to everything I was seeing. And so I remembered that, right? Again, plus it was the best class I ever took in my life. So when I got to college, man, I was deciding outside of uh, biology, what should I do? I was, a, I, was an account, I, was, I was an accounting major all through high school just because I wanted to understand finance and money because my peoples didn't, right? And so I, but I thought accounting was boring as hell to me. I was like, man, this, this is, boy, I don't want to do this in college. Um, so I, I chose economics. Lo and behold, economics is boring as hell, too. <laughs> 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 right? economics, economics is real, right? But, you know, if nobody hears anything, anything that I am saying today, if you don't know anything about economics, go buy your most basic economics book and learn about it. The world is based on economics, right? And, and I like to give a definition of around two words, right? Economics and politics, right? And so when you think about the word the economics, a very basic and simple definition of it is the study of scarce resources. And then when you talk about politics, a basic definition of politics is the allocation of scarce resources. Wow, they intertwine. And so what po the politician's main job is to allocate our resources. They're not really scarce, but they say that, right? Great point. And, and the only reason it's scarce is because everybody can't have everything because they don't know what to do with it. So that's why I majored in economics. And did I, wanna, did I know what I wanted to do with it? No. The main reason I am where I am today is because I didn't want to be where I grew up. I didn't want to be broke. I didn't want to be impoverished. I didn't want to be destitute. I didn't want to be an abuser right, of women, like I saw my step pop and other men around me. Like, I saw my step, I saw other men, like dudes coming out the military, PTSD. My, my family, man, we went from like negative to positive back to negative, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we went from broke, homeless to, you know, buying apartment buildings and running, you know, mechanic shops or renting to people back to nothing. I was yeah. like, how you do that? Yeah, right? yeah. So, so we, I mean, but, but the we, thing is, all of that led you to be where you are now. Yeah, I just I was very observant, man. I watched everything, right? And I so just, when you when you got to Virginia State and you started to get into studying finance, economics, did it click then? And you recognized like this is my life. Like at that point, um, did did anything click in you? And you said, okay, I can make a career out of this. You know what, man? I um. So when we were growing up, right, watching TV. And, and it sort of, we were on the tail end of the industrial age, right? We didn't know that, but we were on the tail end of the industrial age. And the industrial age is all about going to school and then going to work, going to work for a factory, either a factory and a warehouse, right? Like your Ford, your General Motors, or your Nabisco's, or going to work in a corporate factory, right? So that's what the industrial age is about. Um, you know, working your eight hours, taking your breaks, things of that nature. And so we were taught, go to school, get an education, work for the biggest and best companies and work there for 40 to 45 years and you'll retire. You'll be rich. Right. That's what they taught baby boomers. And that's what they're trying to live off of now. But that was the end of the industrial age. Right. And so my thought, my thing was go to school, get an education. Again, I was very defensive minded. Right. I saw I was my major was a reaction to my upbringing. I wasn't offensive minded thinking if I major in X, I'll be rich and this will happen. So, so that's more proactive way of, I wasn't, it wasn't a proactive way. It was more, it was proactive in if I do this, then I won't be here, but it was more reaction. No, and I so got I you. Made, and I like the way you put that. We, we, cause a lot of people still, a couple of things you, you said, a lot of people still operate from a, a defensive position. 
And the whole idea of things being scarce, many people walk around the world acting as, as if things are scarce and we live in abundance. You know what I mean? Like, all we, day. but a lot of people don't recognize that. So th- yeah. there's a couple points like, so, but I never heard it phrased that way, but that's absolutely correct. People operate yeah. like, from a defensive so, standpoint. So I give you, I give you, and I'll jump back into my story real quick, but I'll give you something that's defensive, right? When you grow up broke and poor, right? Those two together, when you eat, you kind of hover over and protect your food, right? If you see you hover and protect, right? That, that's yeah. that because that's that lack. Like somebody might take it or it not, might not be enough. Or usually you got so many people around you, somebody will snatch some of your food, mm-hmm. right? Or you go hide in your food in your house. But if you have, and therefore when you grow up, you continue to overeat and now you got diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, hypertension, all these things, and now you go to the doctor and they tell you, you got to go to this medicine, and now everything you do, you're working out more, you showing it on the gram, now you're a workout beast, <laughs> right? And, yeah. and all of this is a reaction, it's a defensive move, versus if your mindset was 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 offensive and proactive, first of all, that, that, that thought of lack and impoverished, you wouldn't be hovering over your food, right? Mm-hmm. Once you eat, you stop, boom, you're done, you put it away. Mm-hmm. But if you come from an era where you don't know when your next meal is coming or mm-hmm. what's going to be your next meal. And it even shows in how we treat each other. A lot of times the reason we don't support or build <coughs> with each other is because we want to hoard. We don't even want to help each other because yep. that's scarcity mentality, right? It's scarcity mentality. It's, it's 100% right, right? Yeah. And so I can tell you this, Jimmy. I didn't know where I wanted to be, but I said, just get smart, right? Like I, I wasn't on reading level prior until like, eighth grade. I remember I told you I fell seventh grade. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I started buying Donald Goins books and reading those joints. Like Black Man Justice, White Man's Grief, Horse Son, Kenyatta's mm-hmm. Greatest Kid. Like I started reading. I read because them Because that was my neighborhood. Daddy cool. Right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, like because that's, that's what I knew. So I started like, you know, I was reading Daily News, but that was like kind of quick. Daily News and Inquirer written on the third grade level if nobody knew that, right? So it's like, I was like, ah, that's kind of, let me, let me find something else. So I started buying those books. They were cheap. So I would grab them and, and, and read them joints. I'd be sitting out front of my eyes just going through like, yo, this is cool. It's good. Right? So I, that's how I got my reading level up. And I would read out loud on my front steps so that I wouldn't be scared to read or stutter over my words. Right? Because, you know, when you're in class and you ain't really sure, right? And my mom, she happened to buy me, remember that, those encyclopedia uh, Britannica yeah, or yeah. <laughs> right, I had know. one. They don't know how like, lucky they got one, it. You was good. Yeah, they don't right? know how lucky but, they got it. Remember I, them Jones, I didn't have all the letters, but I had some. <laughs> <laughs> that just remind me, remind me of uh, good times when the blind boy was trying to sell them. But anyway, yeah, um, right. Uh, but but that's interesting, man. Because one, of, I tell people all the time, one of the books that um, and I love reading. I read a book a week at this point, yeah. and one of the books that turned me into an avid reader was like the coldest winter ever. And I yeah. always say that because when I read that book... It's the Soldier, right? Yes, it's the Soldier. But I, when I read that book, it clicked. I was like... Because a lot of times when you're in school, you, you're forced to read things that have no interest to you. They're not yeah. culturally relevant. They're not written for someone, you know. Um, and, but reading that book made me search out more books written by African-American authors. And even the, even the classics, the James Baldwin. I, I read Baldwin because first I read Sister Soldier. So that yeah. makes any sense, right? It's so, a yeah, yeah, yeah. So those books are important as, as, as many people like to, you know, downplay those Donald Goins or, or what they call street lit. Um, yeah. But those books are important because it's sort of like a gateway to appreciating, like, you know, reading. So that's, that's, yeah. that's pretty good. So when you're going through Virginia State moving forward, um, you, you get out. What's the first thing you do? So you, you get your degree in what? What's your degree in when you finish Virginia State? When I finished my degree, um, I, my, my degree finished up with economics and a concentration in finance. Uh, at one point I had a minor in information systems. So I was supposed to finish in 1999. Uh, when I got back to actually went back my senior year uh, to do summer school because my freshman year was, was trash. Uh, my first semester of school had a 1.89 GPA, right? Cause I thought I was smart coming from Miami with like a three point something. I thought I was a smart dude. And I got to college. Nobody told me that I should not take, seven to eight classes my first semester yeah right <laughs> i did no, I that, but that, but that's that's another reason why it's important <laughs> to have people that went before you but yeah. in our gener- on our generation we didn't have that no 
So I went up in there and was like, boom, I'm going to knock these Jones out. I'm going to get out early. I took all those classes, man. I had a real decent GPA until two of my three, three credit courses was like a C and a D. It drug everything down, bro. If not mm -hmm. for that, I might have had like a three something, but I didn't know. Yeah. Right. So I was on academic probation. It took my financial aid first semester. Right. It was about to be over before it got started. And so, you know, I wrote a letter, got back into school and uh, got my GPA up, walked onto the football team, made the football team, earned a partial, partial scholarship, got some work study and worked my way through. Um, I had a son who was born my sophomore year. So I really had to be laser focused. I, I was four months beyond 19 years old. So I was 20, right? 20 years old when my son was born, 1996. Mind you, I started college in 95, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So my son was born in 96 in the summer. And, um, you know, I had to really grind at that point. And so uh, pushed my way through, man. And by the time I finished up school, um, I got a chance to play some arena football. Um, I'm a real, like, I'm a real just work hard dude, right? That's, that's real Philly, just blue collar, work real hard, something happened. It was like, oh, you might be able to play pro ball. I was like, I'm just trying to graduate, man. I'm trying to go get this money, right? Like, yeah. I don't know about the pro football thing. Nobody, I'm not that guy. I'm not Chaffee Fields, man. I'm not, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not those dude. Like, you know, we played against those dude. I'm not, nah, I'm trying to get this money, right? So mm -hmm. um, I played arena football for a season. Then they, you know, the agent tried to get me to do some other stuff. But when you got a little boy at home and my real dad, he wasn't really that active in my life. You know, I committed to myself to be a good dad, a great dad, and raise my son. So I walked away from football, you know, and VA came home, and my girlfriend and I at the time had an arrangement. I told her, once I'm done, I would come home because she opted not to go to college because she got pregnant her senior year of high school, and, and our son was born right after she was out of school um, that summer. And so she didn't go to college. She had to raise him. And so I said, all right, when I'm done school, I'll come home, take care of him. And, you know, you can do whatever you want. She was working and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I stuck to my promise, came home, took care of him, you know, bought him with me. And, uh, you know, she would visit like every day and chop it up and all that good stuff. But what ended up occurring, Jim and Corey, is, um, you know, two years later, you know, she ended up, you know, we got together. She got pregnant. We got pregnant. Our second kid was coming. And I was like, all right, brother time to man up. What are you going to do? Right. Either you're going to have a baby mama with two kids or you're going to raise a family. Right. And I really just kind of thought about the way I grew up and was like, I don't want my, I don't want any other man raising my kids. And I want my kids to see me every day. Right. Like dad and know that dad's going to be the provider and the protector in their life. And if they need anything, they know for sure. They ain't got a question that dad's going to be there. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I couldn't say that growing up. Like, I didn't want my kids to experience homelessness, shelter, the dangers that I, I experienced. So I made a move, man, proposed to my girlfriend, now my wife, and got married, raised those two kids, and, and then, you know, got into the professional world. Right out of college, I started with Vanguard. I was there for four years, left Vanguard, started my own entrepreneurial thing as a financial advisor. I wanted to save, the, save our people, man. I wanted to alleviate poverty. I wrote my senior thesis on, you know, alleviating poverty and sort of did a comparison and contrast uh, of the minimum wage between Richmond, Virginia, and Philadelphia, right? Okay. And so I kind of narrow it down. So that was my focus. I didn't like poverty because I came from it. So I was like, man, I want to fix poverty. And my, my professor said, that's going to be kind of hard. And I was like, no, I can do it, right? <laughs> right? I was like, no, I was like, hell bent. Like, no, I'm going to fix it, right? Hindsight being 2020, knowing what I know now, what I really was trying to say is I want to go back to my community and fix what I saw growing up. Yeah. That's what I wanted. Right. But I didn't know how to articulate that then. All right. I did. Right. I just didn't, I didn't want young people experiencing what I experienced. Right. And, and just kind of make it better because I then saw better, man. What, one of the reasons I chose Virginia state university, I went to visit the school and there was like a whole community of black people driving really nice vehicles, owning their homes, and they didn't sell drugs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, it's like, whoa, and they, and dude, they this does, does exist. <laughs> right, it, it hey, exists, right? But that kind of representation matters, though, because coming from here, like, 
they was professional people here, but those professional people was walking in the same jungles you was walking in. Right. And when you went to Virginia State, it, it looked it looked totally different it than different. what you was looking at. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we absolutely you, know what representation mean. matters. That's one of the reasons we have in this conversation. One of the reasons we have this platform is because representation matters. Like, um, we have people doing amazing work in all different fields. So when you uh, when you seeing that, that kind of changed your your worldview. Um, seeing people who are professionals, right? Um, it it did. But I also saw like when I was here in Philly and I was a young boy, I would see people that look like me today. They would not even look at me and say hi. They wouldn't yeah. look at me and would say, what's up, young boy? Or, How you doing? Or give me a pound. Like, I, I do that to young boy. I just, I, random. What's up, boy? How you? We, you know, I, we, I, I specifically say, how you? Like, I look at them. How you doing? Like, I don't say, what's up? Because they, they might get offended. Right? Yeah. So I say, what's up? How, how are you doing, man? You good? You know, have a good day. Like, I say it to them. Right? Yeah, because, it's funny. Because we had a conversation a couple, uh, couple shows ago. I was talking about how... Um, that was one of the things I wanted to start doing, which is speaking to people, right? Yeah. Some, something as small as people, but it's weird in Philly because people look at you like you're crazy. Like, why are you? It speaking? is, <laughs> right? And Jimmy, when you don't smile, you like the meanest dude, <laughs> right? You would have fitted no not smiling. Ah, uh, <laughs> that ice grill is crazy, <laughs> right? That's a, that's Jim, a protection Jim, mechanism. Jim, like about to pull a ratchet out on you. Listen, man, this is right? Philly. But, that's a not, but, but that's a Philly thing. That's a Philly thing, right? Yeah, but that, that, that's, <laughs> the, that's the environment you're in. So, you know, it's right. Protection. Mechanism. Especially, when, especially if you was riding the L or the orange line, Absolutely. you have to have a, like a mean mug. Like, yeah. if you ain't had yeah. one of them, somebody was going to get you. Yeah. So go, going back to that, man, when I got down to Virginia State, I, I had a feeling, and I knew, I said, man, I think I can survive here. But what changed that, I think I can survive here, too. I know I can thrive here. There was a young lady who was at Virginia State University, who was at Omni, who was an alumnus of Virginia State, which is why we got introduced she had family and friends around the school. She took us to visit. We ate at these people's houses. And they said, if you come here, anything you need, you let us know. We want to see you succeed. They said that very clear while we were eating, right? Multiple times. And I was like, yo, I think, man, their, their houses was right across the street from the school in the football field. That's that community, right? though. That's a community. It, it, it was right that, there, right? That's so, so important. Right. So we need listen, that today. Man. We need more of that in 2019. Right. So, so, and, and the last piece about Virginia State, and I'll jump forward. When I went to the lunchroom, and I visited a lot of school, when I went to the lunchroom, uh, a gentleman walked in. He sat down with me, asked me some questions. Hey, how are you? What's your name? Told him my name. Asked me where I was from. And, you know, anytime you're from Philly, they say where you from. You look up like, I'm from Philly. Then you keep it moving. They say, well, part. You're like, oh, come on, man. Like, you don't even know. Like, well, come on. Right. So I said, North Philly. He said, we're in North Philly. I said, oh, this, right? And I, I start tripping, like, come on, man. Like, you, I said, all right, I'm from Ireland. He said, well, I'm from Germantown. I, I tripped, like, what? You from Germantown? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm with the Germantown High. I said, what? It was the president of the school. Oh, representation, right? I'm yeah. sitting down with the president, Eddie Moore Jr., who's from Philly, from Germantown, went to Germantown High the president of Virginia State University, and I'm having lunch with him on my visits to the school. Seal the deal. Boom, going here, right? I got a letter from the, from the football team that says, we, will, we, we, we cannot offer you a scholarship at this time. We cannot come down. I went right back to that counselor and said, well, can you call them and ask, if I walk on, can I earn a scholarship? She called, right? A couple of phone calls, got, got on the phone with the head coach. And she asked that question. I was sitting in the room. He said, she said, well, if he walks on, he, he definitely can earn scholarships. I'm going there. Right? Boom. I, all the other schools, I was getting full ride. California, University of Pennsylvania, Shippensburg, Slippy Rocks. No, that's in the mountains and it's cold. Right? I, <laughs> I went down VA. It was warm. It was December. And it was like 55 degrees. Right? It was February. It was 50. I was like, I'm going here. Yeah. So... Through all that, man, and the reason the weather was important to me, again, I said I'm a chronic asthmatic. So I was one of those asthmatics that my airways restricted when it was cold. So it was hard for, it was hard for me to play ball in the cold. Very, very difficult, right? And the air quality in the city was bad. In Virginia, it was great, right? Who picked school based on the weather and air quality and asthmatic, <laughs> all right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so... When I got there, man, all those things allowed a kid with, I had no money, man. No money. Like, nobody was sending me care packages. 
Nobody would send me anything, nothing, right? I, I had no, I, I couldn't call home for somebody to send me anything. I had a meal plan and tuition, that was it, right? And I would come home in the summers, work at, at Esquire, save some money, enough to get back, pay some of the bills off, and then start all over again. I was always in a hole. I had to come home, work, and I had a son, right, at that point, right? So when I graduated, got into the financial markets, I wanted to be a financial planner, and I thought I could go save our people by teaching them finance. I'd be down North Philly, right? Butler, Ethan Butler, 23rd, Knoxford. I'd, I'd be in the hood, like, yeah. ninth, you know, ninth and American. I'm, I'm in the hood, like, this is where I'm from, knocking on doors, trying to, you know, and I would, I would get referrals, not cold call, referrals, yeah. right? <clears throat> Back then, I knew nothing about networking. I, feel, I thought because I knew people, I had a network. False, right? False. But I, I thought, you know, when I started off right out of school, I was at American Express Financial Advisors. And if you ever saw the Wolf on Wall Street where you just in the room pounding the phones, yeah. I had a job like that right out of school. I stayed there for six weeks. I took one of their license tests, took another one, didn't pass that one. Then I rolled with the Vanguard, right? Because they was paying me a draw. And you don't get paid a draw. You earn a draw, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? And so I'll tell folks about that in a minute. But in any case, <clears throat> I had a son, so I need to pay, make sure he was taken care of and I was taken care of. So what I learned about trying to teach people about personal finance is that not everybody wants to learn it. And also, and also learned that learning is voluntary. Not everybody cared. And how did I know that? <clears throat> I'm at a table talking to people about risk management, i.e. life insurance, disability insurance and then stop most people say i want to invest in stocks i'm like ah not then you probably don't want to do that first right because mm -hmm. it ain't gonna yield you nothing like you you, you put a thousand dollars in stocks and you die that thousand dollars can even bury you mm -hmm. right you buy some life insurance a thousand dollars a year could get you a couple million dollars if you're young and healthy mm -hmm. right and if you die now your family good so don't buy the stock yet, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, invest in some life insurance, a little term, maybe some universal if you sharp, but term, whole life, whatever, right? And those kids that's little, buy them whole life policies because it's cheap. Nobody wants to do it, bro. I mean, the, and the people that did it, they were kind of like just on the cusp of middle class. And then when folks hit the middle class, they think they're good. They think and they would use this phrase, I'm okay. I'm, I'm like, I know you're not because I'm sitting in front of you. Like, yeah. I know where you live, right? <clears throat> so, did I think I would be where I am now? I did. My rip, my my only goal, Jim and Corey, was to alleviate poverty and save our folks, right? Um, and I learned through some mentors later on. Uh, they said to me, "Well, the first thing you want to do to alleviate poverty and and um, brokenness is is don't be one of them." <laughs> How can I help the poor if I'm one of them? Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. said, "Pretty much, help yourself first. Yeah. Right. He said, yeah. get you, you know, they told me get you, get you and your family squared away. At this time, you know, I was renting from my mom. Then we got a little apartment. We were struggling. So I said, all right, cool. I got, got on a mission to focus on wealth for my family. Right. I got on a mission that we got a little starter house, which was hard to do. Even though I have a degree in economics with a concentration in finance, they did not teach me how to do personal finance in school. They did not teach me how to buy my home. They did not. That's interesting, right? right? So, so, so a, de a degree in finance, right? So you're talking theories and all those kind of things, but actual application. Maslow, you're talking all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Our actual application right. isn't taught, right? So that, that's, 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 that's crazy. That's crazy right the there. Ba the basic take care of yourself stuff. Yeah. Right? Now, you know, um, so, it's funny because I had someone tell me that years ago too, about the same exact advice. And, and what they told me was, Act like you on an airplane that's going down. I'm like, what do you mean? You got to put your mask on first before you help anybody else, right? So, so that's the thing. Take care of yourself, right? Yeah, and um, yeah. that's great. And that's so, great advice. So a lot of people, yeah, and, and a lot of people, and, and I really always like to share this, this part of what I'm going to say is most people, when you ask them what they want to do with their life, it's usually a reaction to what they've experienced growing up. I want to be a psychologist. I want to take care of kids. I want to alleviate poverty. It's because it's not, it's what they didn't have. That's not really what you want though. Or it could be, but it's like, is that the reason you're on this earth? Right? Like if you could remove all that stuff, because most of the time we are, are empathetic 
for what we saw, so we want to fix it. So therefore, we go into these fields because we want to fix what we came from, right? You got people being counselors because they didn't get counseled or teachers because they, they had bad teachers. Not saying that you shouldn't do that, but there could be other things, right? If I could rewind time and if I had one of those quote unquote perfect lives with the mom and the dad in the house and, you know, kind of traditional first world problems, <clears throat> but not as drastic as I had growing up. I, I, I could be one of two things right now. I could either be a journalist, right, and a speaker, or I could be a sports medicine physician. I would be one of those two things, right? But because of my environment and what I saw growing up, I majored in economics. I majored in money, right? Because I wanted to understand the origin of money, but currency. So that's why I majored in economics, right? I right, wanted so, to understand. So let me ask you a question. Because I know, I know part of your story is at one point you were working with high net worth individuals. Yes. So you went from, you know, trying to quote unquote save the hood to yeah. working with high net worth individuals um, yeah. as, as a banker. What was something, uh, it's a common trait or something that they had that you noticed from working with high net worth individuals? So high net worth individuals, they, they, all of them had a, a business. Um, all of them had two homes. Uh, most of them were married <clears throat> or divorced, right? It was either married or divorced, but they were, you know, joint with another partner at that point. Um, they all had uh, some sort of retirement plan. Um, uh, also sort of non-retirement plan, right? Like sort of traditional investments. <clears throat> they all had insurances on every level right, from property insurance to auto insurance to home insurance to business insurance. So their risk were, risk was covered. Um, so they all had those things uh, in common. And, you know, there were some other things, but most of them had that stuff, right? Sound like you're had. describing uh, the millionaire next door. <laughs> yeah. And, and so um, transitioning from me trying to save – the hood or save poverty or alleviate poverty, if you will, to work with high net worth individuals, it was challenging, right? Because I had to become some, a person, somebody that they could believe in to now invest their dollars, give millions to invest. And they weren't giving it to me, but the bank or institution that I worked for and, or, you know, if they wanted to borrow millions, I had to become an individual that they trusted to do that. Right. And so the that, really forced me to transform who I was, right? So who was I? I was a young know I mean boy from around the way, up the block, you know what I mean? You know I mean? Talk with the hands like 500 different ways because that's how we chopped it up. Imagine me talking to somebody like that and they have $10 million on so invest. The yeah. conversation, it would be yeah. a non-starter. It's nothing to talk about. It's a non-starter, right? And so I had to learn a few things. And back in the day, we thought this was selling out right that's that's what we thought it was or we thought it was conforming you know when i first got into the work i said i ain't conforming i ain't selling out nah, none of that it was like no you you have to grow and evolve right so i had to tighten up my 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 vocabulary my speaking ability um my emotional intelligence uh my adaptability quotient right right i had to do a lot of personal development for myself for years, training, things of that nature, my communication style. Um, so I had to do all of those things in order to do my job right. Yeah. A job won't teach you all those things, right? They just expect you to have them. So, so when you, you get you the to interview- invest in yourself. You, you had to invest in yourself. I, I had to invest in myself. And so Jimmy, that's the point. Jimmy and Corey, that's the point that I'm trying to get at, right? I invested in me which is why I went back to school and did my MBA. I invested in me. I take leadership courses, leadership role. I challenged the hell out of myself to become something different, right? Like I wanted to be the guy in the room with the nice suit, very articulate. I wanted to be the leader of leaders, right? I wanted to be the sharpest of the sharp. And I was like, man, I do from Brunani you know what I mean? From Omni High School and it's black. Like, how am I going to do that? 
I just stop asking how, and I start reading, I start listening, paying attention to people, finding mentors, for, and, and I was being very specific and intentional about the type of mentors I sought. And, and they didn't become lifetime mentors. They were like maybe mentors for a season, right? Maybe mentors for 15 minute co coffee conversation, right? Oh, that's uh, harsh. That's a, yeah, that's the gem right there because when people think of mentors, they always think it has to be someone, you know, that's going to be in your life the rest of your life. You can have a mentor for 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes, bro, that's it. And then boom, on to the next one, right? Like, you know, yeah. a lot of times people, we, we try to latch on, uh, and then you start learning more about these people. Now you kind of don't like them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, Yo, that's true. That's true story. That is, right? That's because a fact. Because the true story. Fax me that. Yeah. That's, a, that's yeah. A great, another great point. That's a great point. Yo, right? That, like, you crazy. don't want to do that, right? Like, if, if somebody's your pastor or your imam or something, like, you don't want to, like, know everything about them. Yeah, yeah. Keep it's it like, in the like I always say, the worst thing you could do is meet your heroes. Yeah. Just like, just keep them in the box. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's it. And then move on. Like, you ain't going to be hanging out. Yeah, that's my man. You know. Now, listen, in other cultures, they do that. Right? But for some reason, when we, when we do it, we start to judge people. And then we start and, to And, and that, that, that's a whole different on conversation. Pedestal, that's a whole different conversation. Because is. we we, we try to, like, hold people to this standard that just doesn't exist. I mean, people are human. Right? You know, there, there's not one, you know, quote unquote, great leader that didn't have other issues. You, you dig what I'm saying? But, but the fact no perfect man. No perfect. There's no such thing as a per exactly, exactly. So, let me ask you a question, right? So you went to Fox. Uh, you, you got your MBA from the Fox School of Business at Temple, um, and I know that you're like yeah. president of the alumni now. Um, so I am president and, of the and, alumni. And hearing that story is amazing. Like you, you talk about someone who grew up in, in poverty that was homeless several times now. You're the president of the Fox School of Business Alumni Associate. That, that's, that's powerful right there, man. And I know that within your field of, of banking, there's not too many folks at your level of banking that look like us. Um, so, you mm -hmm. know, first off, congratulations, because I didn't even know all this about Yo, your story. Like, you know I mean, like, I've known you for years, but I learned a lot through this, through, through this yeah, conversation. So He's he um, dropping bars, too. He is yeah. really out here dropping bars on the floor. Yeah, but like, but the, one thing I could say, <laughs> the one thing I could say about you, like, and even from following your Instagram, is interesting because you are very motivated, man. Like, you make me yeah. feel bad about myself because you be up at, like, 4 a.m. every morning, like yeah. post, he posts a shot 4 a.m. I'm like, Yo, this dude is up at 4 o'clock. I got I to gotta get my life right. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Corey, hey, Jim, he be in the gym going to sleep at one, hey, one two o'clock. Yo, I'm like Corey, he be in the gym at like four forty five in the morning. Yo, I'm like, yo, I can't lie, Jim. I get up at five thirty every morning, so I, you know. Dog, listen, no, my man be in the gym at quarter to five, man. Like in the morning I, every day. I, I, I haven't done that in twenty years, man. But, but, but it's funny though. The army, man. But now, now hearing your story, I, I understand why. why. Exactly, I see yeah, why. You're so like, motivated. He, he, my man is super motivated to get wherever it is he going. He don't go half speed at nothing. No. Yeah, he go yeah. full speed. Right. So it's funny, and you, it and, you, and you telling your story now, so many things make sense. Even when I talk about, it might have been 20 years ago, we first had a conversation, and some of the things you were talking about, like even the organization we talked about starting years ago. Yeah, all of these I remember. things, I remember, remember that? Yeah, all of yeah, these yeah, things yeah. make sense to me now hearing your full story. Yeah. And um, it's a lot of it's a lot of wisdom and a lot of gems people could take from that because, um, I mean, look where you are now. You you you've worked at pretty much every level of banking. Uh, you're mm -hmm. one of the top um, African American bankers within the region, and mm -hmm. you know you've earned it. I mean, you you pretty much grinded it out. You grinded it yeah. out, and I think a couple of things I've taken from this is um, you know don't don't let your your, your circumstances determine where you're going to go. A lot of times I read and they try to determine where someone's going to end up just based upon their zip code. Right. Yeah. But that that's be it. You're your proof right now. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, that's yeah. the one thing. It's the second thing is investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. That's like a common theme amongst everyone we talk to is that people aren't afraid. To, people that are on the show that are succeeding in whatever it is they're doing, doesn't matter whether they're trading options, whether they're in banking, real estate, mm -hmm. whether they own a media platform, doesn't matter. The one thing that all of you guys have in common is the um, willingness to invest in yourself, self improvement. Mm -hmm. You mentioned like self improvement. What are some of the things like uh, some of your favorite self improvement? Maybe a book or something that you would recommend people out there. Yeah, I got a couple of them, man. I usually run down a long list, but I'll I'll start with uh, what's my man's name? Uh, I love John Maxwell, John C. Maxwell. Yeah, I want to say John C. Maxwell. Any of his books, right? Yeah, he's uh, pretty good. Twenty twenty one 
irrefutable laws of success. Uh, Jack Canfield, um, 64 principles of success. Uh, it's not, it's like more like 64 principles or something like that. But Jack Canfield, you know, the chicken soup for your soul guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, he's awesome. You read any Jim uh, Rohn? Any Jim Rohn books? Yeah. That's Jim Rohn. Guy. I listened to him read a lot of Jim Rohn. Um, Dr. Miles Monroe. He wrote over 60 books, right? So if you just go to YouTube and Dr. Miles Monroe, just Dr. Miles Monroe. He's passed away at this point. He's from Bahamas. He's awesome, right? Very, very awesome. Uh, but I say start with those three. I mean, you, you know, you can read The Random Walk on Wall Street. You can read The Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Jimmy, I'll, I'll share a quick story on that. This is about the books and personal development stuff. At each stage of my life, I knew I had to continue to grow and change, right? And most people, and so here's a book because I'm going to cite it. So the, the book is called The Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck, right? Carol Dweck, PhD. And so, uh, the, growth, so the growth mindset in the book, they talk about having a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, right? And so the fixed mindset just says, you know, if this is the pie, right, this is as big as the pie is going to get, and we all got to eat from this pie, right? A fixed mindset would say, no, this is the pie. I'm sorry, growth mindset says this is a pie. This is the pie, right? And I'll give you another illustration of what that means, what that looks like. Uh, Blockbuster had a fixed mindset. Netflix said, we're going to make the pie bigger, right? And so that's what Netflix did. Netflix made the pie of their industry bigger. Most people think Netflix is a, was a, uh, a movie company, a distribution. They're a technology company. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and, and now streaming is a thing everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And so fixed mindset, growth mindset, fixed mindset just thinks there's things are definite. Like this is it. Right. And, you know, and, and that's and that's never the case. Right. Never. Um, if, if I tell people all the time, if you're in business and you're not trying to put yourself out of business, somebody else is. Right. Right. There's a, right. There's, so, a there's a great podcast uh, called Business Wars. Um, mm -hmm. If you, I don't know if you've ever listened to that, but listen, they have a whole series. What they do, they talk about different businesses and how they've competed. And they have a whole like six part series on a blockbuster Netflix, which is, a, is very interesting for anyone who's interested in the history of business. But mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. One of the things that Netflix was saying to themselves, even as they were like, you know, taking on blockbuster, they were already had their eyes set on HBO. They said, yeah. we're, we're going to become HBO before HBO becomes us. And that was one of the things they would say within their offices. Yeah. They, they had this thing planned out years ago. Yeah. The whole streaming thing was planned out years ago before anybody yeah. knew what it was. But anyway, right. it's an excellent podcast, Business Wars. But that's a great point about that yeah. mindset. Because yeah, so the reason, I make, the reason I say that, the growth mindset and the fixed mindset, you know, that has helped me transition from, you know, the kid from Alney, able to go to college, no money, finish up. Took me five years, right? But, you know, like I said, I, when I failed in seventh grade, I told myself I'll never fail again. So when I got that letter that said, you're on academic probation, I just kicked it into high gear. Boom, graduated, right? By the time I finished school, I was academic honors, dean's list, academic All-American, all that stuff. And I started with a 1.89. Right. Cool. And, cool. and and so as I continued to grow through the years, you know, I became an adult, bought a house, rehabbed it, lived in it. And then it was like I got tired of being at that place in life. And I was like, man, how can I get to the next place in life? And nobody was handing me, you know, um, a go forward pass. Right. Or a skip, skip, go. Pass. Like I wasn't getting that. So I was like, shit. Like, and, and I didn't have the people or network around me to say, you know, let's, here's how you play chess and move, right? Yeah. I played chess when I was in elementary school. So um, what I did, man, I started going back to some of those books that I read when I was younger in my early 20s. I, I went back to The Art of War. I went back to... Sun Tzu. Uh, yeah, Sun Tzu. I went back to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But instead of reading it, I would listen to it, right? And, and I would like, you know, it, this was back maybe like 2008, 2009, 2010. Like for three years, man, I was just listening. Even right after I got out of grad, I was just listening. Even after I got out of grad school. I, and then I said, I want to apply some of this stuff. Right? And Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he said, man, if you can't create an additional $300 a month, like, you know, something's wrong with you. Like if you're perfectly healthy, you should be able to at least create an additional $300 a month. So I was like, all right, well, let me try that. Right? Like, let me, you know, I... Look, I'd have been in several network marketing businesses. They didn't work for me, 
right? I didn't try a couple of like four or five, went down that road, didn't work for me, mm-hmm. right? So I don't knock any of them, but they just didn't work for me, exactly. right? And and so so I did some professional development through some network marketing joints, right? Like that's why a lot of people are in that space because they are awesome at net, at professional development. They will develop the hell out of you. Yes, they uh, will. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes, they so, will. Yeah, the books, the shows, the events, the Super Saturdays, the, oh man, right? Get you all jacked up. And then so what ended up happening is um, after listening to all that, I got into a space where I said, all right, let's make a decision. Let's create a business. And I, got, I went to my wife and I was like, all right, well, what, what is it going to be, right? So, you know, let's, let's do something we can create 300 bucks a month. So first, how was I going to create 300 bucks a month? The easiest thing to do when you when, where you come from is get a second job, yeah. right? So my wife had a second job. When we was moving into the crib, I had a second job. I was working in a bank during the daytime, and I was doing security at night on weekends, right? Like, because we was we had to fix our own crib, move into the joint. It was it was a grind, mm-hmm. right? But that wasn't enough. I was trying to change my mindset at this point. Can I create my own income? And so started a business with my wife. You know, he started super small then begin to grow it. And um, the thought was, as I began, as I'm doing financial planning, working with five high net worth individuals, and now a commercial banker working with, you know, private equity companies, $100 million, $1 billion businesses, I get a chance to look at their financials and sort of see where I want to be, right? Mm-hmm. And I get to see people with millions of dollars in an investment account or you know, things of that nature and, and, and balance sheets, income statements. And instead of just reviewing them and checking them off, I said, well, let's apply that to my life. Like instead of me just doing my job every day, I'm taking some gems from my job and applying it to my life. Mm-hmm. And so the goal was to increase the balance, our personal balance sheet, right? The assets and liabilities, increase the assets, decrease the liabilities. So we went from just having one home, you know, in three years to five, right? And we went from only just having each of us having a job, right, to now having a business, you know, and my wife buying her dream car and, you know, able to take trips whenever she wants. And that business for me, I mean, you know, the conscious decision was to, to one, do that, right, create that, you know, that bolster the balance sheet, create assets, limit liabilities, and then increase the cash flow for the income statement, right, which we did which offset a tax burden that we begin to have because as you get more successful, you earn more money, your tax burden goes up and your tax deductions goes down, right? And you got to hire a CPA and all this stuff. And so I sat down with my CPA and I'm frustrated. man. like, why well, I got to keep paying more taxes? And I got two kids, <laughs> got this, got that. I'm making more money. He's like, yeah, you doing well for yourself. He was like, yeah, and as you keep making more money, you can't write more things off. I'm like, what? What are we talking about? He was like, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a limit to which you can write off because your income's getting, I was like, oh, come on. And so um, he said to me, he said, look, there's a difference. When you think about some of these folks like the Mitt Romney's of the world and the <clears throat> Warren Buffett's of the world and then the average people, there's a reason why, you know, Warren Buffett pays less taxes than his secretary. His secretary is W-2 income. He has earned income. I'm sorry. He, had, he does not have earned income. Right, he has like K one. He, has dividend, he has dividend income. Yeah, dividend income. Yeah. Right, it, yeah. it, and it's not just passive, but it's not earned income. Right. Yeah. So my accountant told me, he said, "Listen, your you need to create, um, you know, additional income, and you need to buy some more assets that you can sort of use use for your tax advance." So we sort of went through a tax strategy, and that that was the main impetus for doing it. Right, and so reading those books, but listening to them and then starting to apply some of that, some of those teachings was what caused the change and the shift from that, from that mindset. And the other thing, man, um, so you asked about the books, which is why I got to all this stuff, man. Look, we was living around the way, right? We were still living sort of in that East Oak Lane area, Fern Mm -hmm. Rock area, right? Owned our crib. You know, I was the block captain trying to keep the block clean and all that stuff. Make sure everybody's good. The hood is real, though, bro. Right, and and I, the reason why I say the hood is real is you know our, our our mortgage was super super low, 
So we was stacking bread, making sure the kids was good, trying to build up. Yeah. Man, we got, look, we got burglarized. Ugh. Right? Twice. I'm mad now, right? Like, I want to hurt somebody real bad, <laughs> right? And when you get burglarized, it, it feels like you get you got molested and you can't do nothing about it as yeah. a grown person. It's a violation. A bad one. And I was like, man, like, damn. Like, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be good around. Like, what you, and you know, like, when it happens, it's usually somebody you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Never a stranger. Not never, but like because I grew up like when I was a kid, we got robbed of like burglarized a lot. It was it was these like crackheads around those so it was some like we you know we it was somebody we knew, right? And my people some more into the streets, yeah. Then so we was like cameras, we found people, right? So as an adult, <laughs> right, as an adult, I was like, all right, either I could try to find them or not. And then I, you know, but God had it, so I found nobody, right? And then when it happened again, man. It happened one year apart, right? One year, we were at a wedding, came back from the wedding, house was burglarized. I was like, all right, cool, no big thing. I was mad. Filed an insurance claim a couple weeks later, everything back, right? I'm living right. A year later, I took my family on a vacation to Myrtle Beach, right? Got a big Escalade, rented that joint, drove out, we was out, right? Spent like a week down Myrtle Beach having a blast with the family. I get a call on the way back. Some random dude tells me he got a, a safe or something like that was open and some papers on my name. I'm like, what? I get home, right? I, I go meet the dude or whatever. I get back to my crib. My house is burglarized again. And I'm telling the story to get to a point, so hopefully people hear it. I was very angry this time, right? Like, you know, bad. I was angry, right? Uh, where I want to hurt for my anger. But because of my beliefs, man, and, and, and I believe, you know, God does things for a reason. I think that was God telling me it was time to move, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you've outgrown this place. This place has outgrown you, right? You got, you got to move. And so now it was really time for me to get my mind right and take action. Because if not, right, somebody's going to get hurt, right? Because I don't want anybody to hurt my family, so I'm going to hurt somebody. And, and I don't want any of those things to occur, right? And I sort of saw how the community was impacting my kids, my wife. And I, I had to make the change, right? And so from that, man, we, we moved on and, and moved out of the neighborhood, still own the house and bought some more. Like, you know, we don't live there, right? But we still own everything and yeah. still come back, right? So, and my wife, when we, when we was ready to move, she said, like, well, well, let's just sell the house. I said, no. Now is when this house becomes an asset and can produce income. Let's use this house as an asset and allow it to produce income for us so that we can move on and grow. Let's do that. If you don't do that, then we just out of a house and maybe we got a couple thousand dollars and we'll probably blow it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right? because what you, what you, the, each house is a seed. You know what I'm saying? You're planting the seed. You know, um, that's 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 going to continue to to grow, and it's interesting to say that that you, as man, going through that is crazy, right? Um, bad, yeah, bad, bad right? And the funny thing is, got harmed, but yeah, bad. the crazy part is like that. You know, people still uh, still have their houses broken in today, but there's it's so much cameras and technology around that kind yeah. of stuff. Like, don't even really happen as as much, but I guess it does. Is. Yeah, right, and and you know, dumb me, right? not having the security system the first time, not having the, you know, uh, anything. I was like, all right, time to get security, time to do this, time to do that. Did all those things, man. So, yeah. I, you know, what, what brought me to this place in my life was all of the experiences that I had growing up. And there was somebody that I wanted to be and become. Um, mm -hmm. And so I had to start designing that person. And, you and know, uh, one thing you said, the, one thing you said that's very important, and I just want to stop to highlight this, is you talked about how... You got into self development. You read the books, but you took action, right? Mm -hmm. so, Corey, that's another thing that that's, a, that's, a, that's the the common thread, man. The common thread, right? Self development, but also the taking action. Because I know people that um been taking self development courses literally for twenty years, and you know the person I'm talking about is probably gonna watch this, but you know who you are. But some people have literally been doing self development for twenty and haven't started to do anything. And like we talked about when we first got on here, I'm like, yo. This, these days, you could push a button and own something, 
because one of the things we preach is just ownership. Understand the power of ownership, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and something else you said about just looking at a balance sheet. Like, when you really break it down to it's fun, it's very simple, right? Either you got to earn more, spend less, you know what I'm saying? But or or, or have things that are going to give you more income. But that that's that ownership piece. Um. Before we get you out of here, we've been on for a while. Before we get you out of here, I got to ask you a question, though, because you are in banking, right? And we talked about what got you to this point. Um, you know, you're a successful banker now within the area. What do you see as the future of your industry, right? Because you just you you brought up yourself about you know um, looking at things different ways. The whole Netflix blockbuster comparison. Mm-hmm. What do you see as the future of banking, though? Because there, you know, you got you have the people who talking about digital currencies. You have all sorts of things happening around the world of banking. What do you, you have AI coming down the way, you have cryptocurrency, and I, I'm not trying to throw a bunch of buzzwords out there, but these are things that I'm pretty sure you have to think about when you look at the future of your industry. What do you think? Yeah, I think banking is, is getting a lot more becoming, a lot more advanced than it was in, you know, the eras of, over the last 100 plus years, right, since the banking system came into effect, uh, since, you know, Alexander Hamilton. Everybody wanted to go see the Hamilton play. Probably has no clue of who Hamilton was, right? The first U.S. Uh, Treasury Secretary, <laughs> right? That created the banking system, for those yeah. who don't know, right? And so it's very different than when it, when it was then because the world is becoming more global, meaning people want to connect from other continents, other countries, and they want to do business. They want to exchange exchange they want to exchange things right they want to barter they want to exchange things and so the reason i say things is because i don't want to use the word you know dollars i can say currency but that that changes which where you have digital currency like cryptocurrency and things of that nature right um Vitacoin and, and xrp and bitcoin and so forth and so on and so those things are being used for different stuff right like you know um sort of ach transfers right and that those some people know them as wires or interbank transfers but now they're doing that through cryptocurrency right through blockchain technology just to kind of be very specific about it right so that fraud can't be you know can't happen as much or detected um so that's where innovation and technology is playing a big role and so i think for you know, and I started off talking about poverty and impoverished. So the people that are not as educated about banking need to be very educated. It's not just about a checking account and savings account, right? It's not just about picking the phone up and taking a picture of your of your check and depositing it or putting your card on Apple Pay, right? Like you got to really understand the security behind all of these services, whether it's Zelle or People Pay, Cash App, Venmo. Like these services didn't exist five years ago. Right. And now these services exist crazy. And, and we use it so haphazardly thinking it's not a financial transaction. It's not a bank. Like all of these companies are really trying to be banks. Right. Like Venmo Cash App. They're not a bank now, but you move enough money through them and they gonna keep having your, have your information. They, they're going to become a bank. Right. Uh, it's crazy. When you say that I, I just just to think if five years ago, none of these things exist. That's Didn't crazy. Exist. That's yeah, crazy. Right. When you think about fast think, now. Yeah, when you think about Brinks, everybody, if you don't know who Brinks is, Brinks, the armored car folks who move money from one place to the other, right? Brinks is a bank now, right? You look online, Brinks can give you a debit card with money in it. Brinks, they, they do that, right? Like, you know, rush card, things of that nature. So there's banking is moving to, so you very different levels. You have the AI, you have the cryptocurrency piece, of course, with blockchain behind it, you also have um, fintech, right? So financial technology banks, where it's not really brick and mortar, but it's more banking in the cloud, if you will. The all it is, the whole, yeah, all it is is a whole bunch of servers in a warehouse somewhere, all right? That's the cloud. It ain't in the sky. It's in a, it's in a, um, a CPU farm, a computer farm. That's the cloud, right? It ain't really up. It's over there somewhere, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, but fin- like fintech, cloud, fintech not- has been very disruptive to the industry. Yeah, so big time, big time. There's so many fintech companies, and they 
the regulators can't keep up with them. Regulators or politicians can't really keep up with it, so they can't regulate it as much. So sometimes they put a freeze and hold on it. When you think about one of the other sort of financial acts that came into effect after the Great Recession, Great Recession was uh, the Jobs Act, right? That came into effect, um, and then there was a couple of other sort of amendments to the Jobs Act, which allowed crowdfunding to exist. Mm -hmm. um, you had the Dodd-Frank Act and things of that nature, but the Jobs Act, which you know included the crowdfunding piece and some other ones, that expanded the landscape as far as the financial markets are concerned and why people can do a lot of crowdfunding and things of that nature. Um, and that's sort of at the very low basic level of banking and finance. Um, and then I think they're trying to repeal the Glass-Steagall Act as well, which allows, you know, sort of banks and investment companies to sort of merge together. Right now they're separate, so they're trying to repeal that. So yeah. there's a lot that's happening there. Um, I, I, but I always feel like, um, and me and Corey have this conversation all the time um, about uh, what we call the cobalt. But, like, like, the thing about banks is, like, they'll figure it out. They may swallow each other up, but they're always going to be a player in whatever's going on. Um, yeah, banks are central to the American to any economy. Absolutely, right? they are central. Um, a book that I'm actually rereading now, um, uh, "The Creature from Jekyll Island," is a, a, a book, but it's about the you know how banks play a part in our um, society and how the central bank was founded. It's a story, so it's a pretty interesting book. Just want to bring that up. We always like to uh, talk about different books, but um, yeah, it's interesting. Your 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 actual uh, industry is interesting to see what's going to happen in the future because you know at things like you said, things are moving so fast. Mm -hmm. um, one last question before we get you out of here. Out of everything that you've been through, so you're very successful now. You told us about you know all of the different struggles you had throughout your life. What would you say was the most challenging time in getting to be the person you are? What was the most challenging uh, out of everything you went through? What would you say is the most challenging? Good question, Joe. Hmm. Uh, you know what, man? Because I... I'd say the most challenging for me is sort of cultural diversity within these organizations um, because I've, I've often wanted to leave the corporate world um, and not come back, right? A lot of people sort of feel like that sometimes or being the only guy in the, not only guy, only black guy in the room, right? But still need to speak with the deep voice, right? And, and not be, you know, apologetic about being who I am. Um, it, it's probably not the biggest one, but I would say the most consistent challenge. Um, the biggest challenge, it's hard for me to pinpoint the biggest challenge. Yeah, I'm, I'm all about accountability. I say the biggest challenge is usually me, right? And what I think and feel about uh, how I am progressing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the biggest challenge, myself, right? Um, and, and continuously growing and developing, uh, but sort of moving at the pace of maybe an organization or, you know, where I think I should be. So for me, the biggest challenge is me, right? I am my own hurt, right? Sometimes I get in my own way. Um, so I think that that's, kind of the way I, I, yeah. I, I am a very strong optimist, man. I think in order for me to have gotten to this place in life, I had to be an optimist as a kid. I had to be an optimist as a young adult, as an adult, where I am now, middle-aged adult, whatever the case may be. I think I had to be, but it's ingrained in me, right, to All be right. an optimist. And so it's not just about being positive, but more sort of a visionary optimistic about what I'm driven to do and sort of seeing the better side of things, right? Because I think if you see the better side of things, it, 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 it's a different energy that vibrates through yourself when you see the better side of things. When you go into a football, basketball, or any kind of competitive game, if you see that you're going to lose, you're going to lose. And you right? just mentioned something, right? So you talked about <clears throat> seeing faces that look like you at your level of banking. Um, how many African Americans do you see? Like, I know you don't see, you can't see many. I can count them on my hand. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. One hand. Right. Yeah. So, how many do I see in the city? Um, there may be more, but like, I know there's a young brother over at TD. I know one over at Wells. I know a couple over at United Bank. Um, 
but it's not many. No, nah, like I, it may be 10, right? But the ones that's up here where I am? Yeah. No. Nah. Now, think about that, right? You talked about how banks are central to pretty much everything we do. But at that level of banking, we don't have that much representation, which means we still have a lot of work to do. Because yeah, a lot of work. About, when you think about what banks mean to a society, right? Man, listen, um, a lot of great information, man, but uh, we got we to gotta get off of adventure because we could talk all night, man, because you, you, you're you a wealth of knowledge, um, very, very motivational. And I just want to say before we got here, I really appreciate your transparency because I think a lot of people um, need to hear this story because you have an amazing story. You, you got like a movie, man. Yeah, yeah my man, living a like, motion picture. Yeah, my man, I, I, you know, you're like the Philly Chris Gardner, man. Like, you, you got a movie out here, man. Oh, man. Yeah, man. That's the, that's the goal. That's the yeah. goal to get there one day. But I tell you, Jim, the reason I share the story, and I wanted to make this plug with the reason I share, it took a very long time in my life to realize that all the stuff that I've been, all the stuff that I went through was was my life workout, if you will. I always talk about being in the gym working out. It was my resistance training to build my strength. And so it was my struggles was my strength it was necessary. to be who I am today, right? It was necessary. Like, that's why I have to look at it that way. Yeah, and you know what? It's important for, for us to share that, too, because a lot of times, like, uh, through social media and other podcasts, people will come on and talk about all the great stuff, right? Tell you about how many deals they closed or, you know, the vacations they took. But people don't talk about the struggle and what it takes to get to where you are, right? Yeah. You're there now, but that journey... That journey is important, man, because Real. there's somebody out there going through their journey now and they need to hear that, yo, you, you're yeah. going to take it as long as you keep working. So I wanted to share a couple of things, right? So people hear all these stories and they've heard the story, to, but, and I, and I, and I thank you, Jimmy and, and Corey for bringing me on, but the, you know, I wanted to share the backstory, the context, and then sprinkle some things in there about what I've done in my career and being in banking. And, and so what I do on a daily basis, I work with companies that, um, need to borrow anything from a million dollars up to about, you know, $80 million, right? So I finance anything from hotels, manufacturers, distri distributors, so operating businesses. And, you know, I have very strong experience around understanding business, how they work, how they operate, and how to help them sort of generate additional revenue, income, understand their management structure, culture, all those different things. So not really just kind of looking at the books, but really knowing what it takes to run a business and talking to business owners, being able to connect with them in that way. Um, you know, I've, I've put over you know, $60 million on the street in this bank and in some other banks, a whole bunch more. And, you know, I've also worked in a space where I used to help minority-owned businesses secure contracts through supplier diversity and things of that nature. So, you know, while people may hear the story of the struggle and what it take to get to get, what it took to get here, I also want to share there's some technical knowledge, right, that's here, so that you know the next time we're on this podcast or and having this discussion, mm -hmm. we want to have some technical questions about what does it take to acquire a business, grow a business, or sell a business, yeah, uh, yeah. or even merge a business, right? That's a, we can, we'll, we'll, we we'll have, have a whole other episode yeah. we can talk about. We can definitely do that in the future. Have another episode we can talk about those things, how to acquire a business and all, because that, that's great information. But I just wanted you to share your story this episode because yeah. one of the things, like, you know, a lot of our guests have been able to do is be transparent and share that story because it's very, very important. And I'll make sure I'll put your Instagram link and every, all your uh, social media links within the uh, description as well. So people can see, you know, some of the work you're doing, man, and you can motivate them to get up four o'clock too. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got another story behind why that happened. <laughs> that, that happened, Jim, from the change in mindset, man. When I was average, I was getting up at six thirty in the morning, getting my kids ready, getting them on the bus, and I said, "I'm tired of being average, right? I want to be extraordinary. What is it going to take to be there?" So over a course of years. I started moving my clock back until I got to start getting up at four o'clock in the morning. Wow. I used to be a six thirty average American dude, right? Wow. Not this is this average because average, you get up at six thirty. I just want to hold on though. What time do you go to bed though, man? What time do you go to bed? I need to know this. So, yeah, so so it ranges. I go to bed anytime between ten and eleven thirty. Right now, if I get, if I get to bed at midnight, I I need to get five and a half to six hours, right? If I if I if I can't get five and a half to six hours. I'm going to be groggy during the day. Like, I won't be able to have this conversation like yeah. this. Right? So I need to give them five and a half to six. Um, so if I start to get close to that midnight, 
I moved my four o'clock back to at least five, five thirty. Gotcha. Right? Okay. And all right. All me, right. Gotcha. Yeah. For me, like I can't touch the gym at seven. Like if I touch the gym at seven, because I'm in there for two to two and a half hours. So if I touch the gym at seven, I'm out at nine. I'm late for work. My day is all crazy. So I, I'm not one of those real quick workout dudes. Like my, my workout is really for my mind. You know, like the the health benefit happens, but I'm there for this. Mm -hmm. No, right. no doubt, no doubt, man. Listen, man, we appreciate you, man. Corey, you got any questions before we get out of here, man? Nah, man. My my man James is Stone Cold Killer. We need <laughs> we need killers like this on our team. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, man. I, I just want to say again, man, thank you for sharing your story, man. It's, it's very inspirational, man. Like I said, I learned a lot about you myself, man. And now everything makes sense, man. Everything makes sense. You live in a yep. movie, man. Thank you. Thank you, man. You live in a movie, man. Listen, and to our uh, listeners and followers out there, um, we appreciate you. Make sure you share the story if you got any questions for him. I'm going to put his Instagram link in the uh, description box. But listen, man, this is a brother out here doing amazing things. He's going to continue to do amazing things. He's out here putting millions and millions of money on the street, man. Trying to help our trying to help our brothers and sisters build huge businesses. So uh, make sure you share this content. People need to see that, you know, listen, doesn't matter where you start, right? Because you you can make it. You know what I mean? It's all about that discipline, man. And that discipline is what you have, man. Mm -hmm. But listen, man, as we always say, people, it's not about how much money you make, it's about how much you keep. Game elevates, man. And we shall see y'all on the next episode. Peace. <laughs>